I'm Steve Walsh. I'm uh, the director of the Texas Tech Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Um, and uh, we do a variety of things, but one of the things we do is work with local school systems on their professional development work, especially in social studies and history and, and related matters. Um, so we are um, part of co-sponsoring uh, the day, and, and one of the things that we've done is found some really good people to talk about some of the issues that in your classes uh, may come up as part of the curriculum or in discussion. And today we have a, a fellow who um, I've known now for several years, as you probably can tell from the way I speak, I wasn't born and raised in Lubbock, I just came here five years ago, uh, but I've gotten to know Professor Russell Dabbs, who teaches at Lubbock Christian University, uh, one of our very fine local institutions. Um, and uh, Dr. Dab does a variety of things. In addition to teach, he also runs the Lubbock Economic Council. Uh, he is an authority on economics and health care. Uh, you are a Texas product, not a... I am a native Texan. Native Texan. So. However, I did grow up in Wisconsin. <laughs> but came back. I did, yes. Yeah, see, the, 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 the heart tugged him back here. Um, and he's going to talk today about economics and government, the relationship between the political system, the economic system, the market, uh, government management of the economy. Uh, really, that kind of encompasses uh, at least 50% of all the political debate that goes on and the divide between the two parties and between what we call liberal and conservative in the United States. So it's timely, it's important, and I give the floor to Professor Dabbs. Thank you. Well, good morning. I didn't know exactly how many I think. It was supposed to be about 15, but I don't know. Maybe there'll be a surge. Uh, You're getting a tutorial. I have never, yeah, yeah. I, so I may have to uh, <laughs> uh, adapt my remarks a bit. But I'm pretty adaptable, I guess. Uh, here, I've got, a, I've got one for you, too. Uh, yeah. okay, sure. <laughs> um, so let me go ahead and, and ask what your background is and what do you teach and what you do. Uh, I'm Jennifer Crossway. I actually teach here at Coronado. Um, I have a bachelor's and master's in history, and then a master's in secondary ed, and I teach AP Human Geography. Okay. Do you teach Do you teach in government classes? Um, I do like a government crash course because they need to understand like the scale of power. And some countries have federal government, some countries have unitary governments, and what that division looks like. So I do it from that perspective. But they talk about this a lot because we talk about like quality of life and standard of living and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah. And remind me, what was your name again? Jennifer. Jennifer. Yes. Crossweight. Crossweight. Yes. And your name? Is? I'm Perry Clark. I'm from Old Old High School and small South. Dan Blockers. Yes, that is correct. There you go. <laughs> I have gone to the, to the Dan Blocker statue. Yeah, there you go. Took my son there when yeah. he was small, so he could see. Yeah. Well, I've always been in small schools, really. You know, this is a six man school, so, you know, if you're from small schools, you get moved from one subject to the other, depending on, mm -hmm. or teaching them all, depending on where you're at. So, right now, I'm with the uh, U.S. history in high school and the eighth grade. Okay. U.S. history. All right. So I had taught government a, a couple of years okay. in the past. And uh, so just kind of get a feel for um, you know, my prior expectations. I've never been to a social studies extravaganza, but it sounded exciting. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but it was <clears throat> a government in economics. It said something in government in economics. And, uh, uh, so that's kind of what it's pitched to is you're going to be uh, well, government just, or. Just just seemed interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, and I can always pick up a thing or two I can use in my classes. Yeah. Yes. And so what I've, what I've got, I've, I've got a presentation that um, uh, I'm was working on trying to be adaptable to whatever I had to do. But, that, but at the very least, you know, if it, if it didn't come off, you'd have sort of like a, a, a unit that you go back to and kind of look at. So, so let me uh, go through some of this, and I may or start with uh, with it, I may kind of deviate uh, away from it. 
uh, from what I've got prepared, but at least it'll be a structure that I can uh, start with. So, uh, as Dr. Paul Balch had said, um, uh, I think this is a timely thing when they said government and, and uh, economics. So, well, you know, what's one of the most important uh, issues right now uh, going on in government aside from uh, the Mueller investigation, I guess. But take all that stuff out, you know, what is the big uh, issue uh, that is going on? And that's uh, probably in healthcare, uh, at least on the, on the domestic side. So uh, in the news right now is the uh, so-called Obamacare and the uh, repeal and replace legislation uh, that uh, recently passed the uh, House of Representatives very, very narrowly to 217 votes to 213 votes. It's almost as narrow as you can, as you can get. And that was just uh, a little over a month ago and it was sent, into, uh, sent to the uh, Senate for uh, consideration the Senate right now is deliberating behind closed doors, as the media is saying. It was just this morning in the AJ is there's a story about uh, the Senate, you know, behind closed doors, as if that doesn't happen quite a bit anyway. But uh, uh, so something's under consideration uh, in the Senate. Uh, it's almost a misnomer, I think, to say that the the legislation that passed the House is under consideration. I mean, yeah, they're considering it, but they're really kind of coming up with their own uh, deal. And, and so we don't really know uh, what exactly is going to come out of that. Um, so I want to focus uh, largely today on uh, the Affordable Care Act, which is more uh, uh, specifically known as, uh, or uh, why, uh, precisely known as the Patient Protection Act. Uh, it's also known as Obamacare, uh, which I don't really like referring it to that, so I'll call it the ACA. And uh, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about the healthcare economy, uh, uh, the structure of the uh, of healthcare in the U.S. system, first of all. Uh, and I'll link it with economics. Uh, uh, economics in general, is it, if, you, if you had an economics course in, in college, do you remember? Um, now, that's, there's one thing about, have you had one? The second is, do you remember? <laughs> uh, what I usually say in my classes is, you know, if we get to the end and two weeks after, or two years after uh, the class, uh, if, uh, if somebody asks you, what did you learn in this class? And you say, I, I don't know, there was a bunch of graphs. Uh, that would probably be very common, but I would also regard that as a failure, that if that's all graphs, but it's quite, it's quite uh, common, though, that I think people get out of a econ class. I don't remember much of that, but there were a bunch of graphs. Uh, but the basics of economics are, uh, the basic cru uh, crux of economics is uh, the clash between uh, limited resources and unlimited wants, and which requires choices to be made, and a whole range of things at a very high uh, level. Uh, the choice about what economic system, are we going to have sort of a command and control type of system, top-down decision making as to how, you know, deciding the economic, the answers to the basic economic questions, uh, what's going to be produced, who's going to produce it, how much is going to get produced, who's going to get the fruits of production, those basic economic questions. Is it going to be a sort of top-down command and control or a bottom-up sort of decentralized market-based uh, system? Of course, most economies are somewhat mixed in a certain proportion of both uh, government and uh, market-based decision-making. Uh, so choices have to be made at the very top level like that. And this is how you're basically going stru to structure your entire economic system. Also individual choices uh, as to how to allocate your uh, household budgets to various types of uh, desires that you might have. Uh, so, uh, choice is sort of at the, at the heart of economics. You have to make choices as to how to allocate your scarce resources. And that's certainly something that uh, is uh, applicable very much to, uh, uh, to um, healthcare. 
So we, what do we want from our healthcare system? I think this is, if you come, this is one of those things where if you come away, I, I tell my students uh, uh, when I'm teaching healthcare economics, we also teach, uh, co-teach a, a class in uh, the LCU Master in Nursing uh, program called Management of Healthcare Resources. And I say, if you come out of this class just knowing these things, these three things, these three words, nothing else just these three words that's all you remember from this class I'll be enormously disappointed but you will know at least these three important things which is cost access and quality so if you're thinking about health care and you're trying to say if, if somebody asks you at the end of the class today or at the end of the day you go home and uh, uh, you, you're, you're talking to a spouse or, or a child or something or neighbor and Ask what you what you learn about healthcare economics, cost, access, quality. That's the, that's always where to start. That's uh, healthcare economics is a very complicated story, but it starts very simply, just simply, cost, access, and quality. So, what do we want from our healthcare system? We want um, we want the low cost, we want low cost, wide access to care and quality care. Uh, what we really want is um, high quality care for everybody at zero cost. That's really what we want. Now is that, but is that possible? So, uh, so choices have to be made. You have to kind of balance this. And also I've got a little uh, balloon here. So this is a very common way that uh, healthcare economics is sort of thought about as sort of squeezing on a balloon. Uh, that we've got these three things that we're interested in that we want. Um, but they kind of compete against each other. If we have, uh, if, if you want to have very wide access to care, everybody's got as much access to health care as they want, uh, we might squeeze that part of the balloon, but we might expect you know, problems to emerge in the other parts of the balloon, higher cost, maybe lower quality. Uh, same thing if we uh, want uh, to get a handle on our costs, we might squeeze the costs try to get control of costs, but that will probably have some uh, uh, negative consequences on access to care. Uh, one way to uh, reduce costs would be to uh, put up greater barriers to care to people so that they can't use it. Uh, so, uh, or uh, getting a hold of costs, you might be able to provide a wide cost, a wide access, to low cost, but very low quality care. So that's possible too. So it's a, a it, it's often thought to be similar to, to squeezing on a balloon. Uh, how do you manage, how do you balance these three important goals that we have? Uh, well, let me take each one of these uh, in, uh, a bit very quickly to look at uh, the overall structure and size of the economy, uh, the healthcare economy. Uh, the broadest numbers that we use to assess how big the healthcare economy is is a statistic called national health expenditures. And in 2015, which is the most recent numbers available, uh, that's three point, uh, the healthcare economy uh, constitutes $3.2 trillion. Well, $3.2 trillion is a number that is just not comprehensible in any way. Is it large, is it small? Well, it's large compared to my bank account, uh, but is it, Large compared to what? You know, so it, it's it, 3.2 trillion dollars. What does that mean? What, and so uh, there's really two other ways to look at it that's, that's more helpful. One is in terms of uh, dividing it by the population, so the per capita or per person uh, amount spent. Uh, so in the United States, that's uh, close to ten thousand uh, dollars per person. You can kind of see how that's grown uh, uh, since 1960 grown pretty significantly, and these numbers are adjusted into 2015 dollars, so it's uh, sort of an apples to apples inflation adjusted comparison. Um, so it's true that lots of things are cost more today, uh, we spend more today uh, than we did 55 years ago, uh, because prices of everything are higher, but adjusting for that, changing everything, sort of adjusting into 
2015 prices, there's still a very, very high amount you know, it's, uh, of spending relative to what used to be uh, half a century ago. Uh, so here's another graph to kind of show that, uh, same numbers. This is something, though, that if we make some comparisons to other countries, uh, we see, it's kind of hard to see here, but you kind of vaguely see that, uh, of course, here's the United States compared to other countries, and on a per capita, per person basis, we spend just a lot more. And that's something that is going to be common. You've probably heard that before. We spend more than other countries do uh, on healthcare. So that's one way that uh, uh, we get that kind of um, conclusion is based upon per capita spending. Uh, another way to, to look at that is as a percentage of our gross domestic product, which is the, the number that gives us the, the, the size of the total economic pie. So if we took the national health expenditures divided by U.S. gross domestic product, uh, it comes out to be uh, about almost 18% of the, of the economy. So a way to look at it is you know, about 18%, almost, almost a fifth of the entire economy is somehow related to healthcare, which is pretty big now. And, that, uh, and you can see again how that's gone up over time. The graph kind of always, again, remember it's economics. There were a bunch of graphs, so here's another graph. Uh, it was 1 20th of the U.S. economy back uh, uh, in the early 60s, and that's grown fairly significantly over time to about one-sixth of the U.S. economy. Um, and again, compared to those other sort of selected countries, um, so for example, a lot of times we compare ourselves to Canada. So Canada's here and we're here. Uh, so they spend less, less of their economy is devoted to health care than is the United States. And you can, again, across the board, uh, the United States, the, the healthcare economy as a, as a, as a uh, percentage of the entire uh, economy is, is a big part. And it's often said that uh, we spend too much. And you're, here, look at all these other countries. They spend a lot less uh, than we do. And I always kind of come back with that as well. If all the other countries were to jump off the Empire State Building, should we do that too? I mean, just because other countries are, are spending less than we are, that, I mean, my question would be, what, how much should an economy uh, be composed of healthcare? Maybe, maybe all these other countries should be spending more, like us. Uh, so it, 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 it's often kind of said, well, we spend too much US economy uh, uh, spends too much on health care, too much of our economy is devoted to health care. And then my rejoinder was, well, what is the appropriate, uh, what is the correct number? What is the correct percentage of the of GDP that uh, health care should constitute? And the thing is, there really, there isn't a, you know, correct number. Maybe, maybe we want to spend, I mean, we spend more on health care and we spend less on entertainment. I doubt it, but, but maybe that would be the case. So, uh, so uh, whereas I do kind of like to push back on the idea that we spend too much and too much of our health care is uh, because the, the, the suggestion is that we need to cut back uh, because you know, we're spending too much. There really isn't an objective number as to how much maybe we want to spend more. Maybe we as a society to want to, to spend more, and devote one of our resources on health care in comparison to other things. I mean, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Uh, however, um, having said that, it is also a good thing to think about as to whether we're spending money wisely or efficiently. That's a different matter. So, um, there is a lot of consensus. There's a wide consensus that the economy, uh, the healthcare economy, is, is wasteful. It spends too much for what we get out of it. Okay. That's about where the consensus is. Um, 
And so this, I pulled this from uh, the economic report to the president in uh, 2010, because that was the one uh, right before the passage of the Affordable Care Act, where they were making the case that we need to reform, comprehensively reform the entire health care system, because it's too expensive and, and for other reasons. And uh, so it was, this, this graph right here shows uh, national health expenditures as a share of gross domestic product again, uh, about that time, about 17% in 2009. And the projection was if current trends continue, which current trends never continue, but if current trends continue, uh, by 2040, it'd be, we'd be going from about 17% to about a third of our entire economy would be, uh, would be healthcare related, which I doubt that anybody really wants to spend a third no matter how much we value healthcare, we do value other things. So we don't want to say we have high quality hair health care, all health care all we want, uh, but we have to eat grass because we don't have enough resources really to have enough food there. So I doubt that anybody would actually want to have um, health care constitute a third of the entire economy. Uh, and so uh, uh, one of the main goals of the Affordable Care Act is was called bending the cost curve, which is one of those uh, buzz terms at the time. I just sometimes still hear about how we want to bend the cost curve, we want to get those cost projections and such downward, and we have to comprehensively reform the entire system in some fashion to be able to do that. Access, so again, it's cost, uh, cost access, and quality. So we've looked a little bit about cost, or about access. And access to health care in the US uh, comes largely through access to insurance, which is really not exactly the same thing. Uh, so we, we, we talk about access uh, to health care. Uh, we're often very loose in that terminology, because what's always being referred to as access to health insurance. And most people get access to health care through insurance, but you can, you can get, plenty of people do get access to health care without any insurance. A lot of uninsured people that are nevertheless not denied uh, access to health care. Uh, it may not be the highest quality health care or the most timely health care, uh, but for example, there is a federal law that prevents somebody, if you go, if you go to the, the emergency room, you can't be turned away. Uh, so uh, you can't, you know, nobody is completely denied access to health care. So the health insurance is a different matter. And so uh, insurance is simply a way uh, to sort of pool a bunch of small payments into one big pool. So we get a whole bunch of people making, you know, if it works well, you get a whole bunch of people making small premium payments into a large pool, most of whom are not going to make any claims on it. But some people will make claims that are very large and difficult to manage uh, without the insurance. Uh, and so when insurance works well, you have a lot of people chipping in a little bit so that a few people within that pool are able to access large amounts from the pool at a particular point in time. Um, in the U.S., the uh, private uh, insurance uh, is, um, is largely obtained through employer-based group plans, which is an interesting, always at various points saying, oh, this is really interesting. We'll go here. Um, but do you know why? Do you know why we have largely a, an employer-based plan uh, system? Probably not. It's, 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 an, it's an accident. It's, it's a result of World War II, another result of World War II, and many of the results of World War I. I blame World War I for everything. <laughs> World War I caused World War II, World War II caused it. Um, In, in, during World War II, there were price, wage and price controls um, that were imposed to try to keep inflation from uh, 
being rampant through the U.S. economy. Um, there were also labor shortages. Uh, why were there labor shortages in World War II? Because people were sent off to work. Yeah, so that, uh, and back then, you know, who, was, who were the main people that worked? Men. Yeah, men. So most of the, a lot of the men were off in, in the Pacific and European theaters, and so there were uh, labor shortages. And so you've probably seen the pictures of Rosie the Riveter. Uh, you know, women came into the workforce because a lot of men had gone. But no, another way to try to, if you're in, uh, if you're uh, got a bit, if you have a business and it's in World War II and you're having trouble getting people to work, one way to try to attract more workers is to hire is to pay higher wages. Uh, but there were wage and price controls that prevented that. So there was only a limited amount of room they could, could, could attract more workers by offering higher wages. So what, they, what a lot of businesses did was offer what was a relatively new uh, product called uh, health insurance uh, as a fringe benefit. So, you can, so that was a way around that. You could offer uh, health insurance. It wasn't wages, so it was a fringe benefit uh, that you could help attract workers. Uh, and then after World War II, and, there was, and because it wasn't wages, uh, it wasn't taxable like regular income, earned income was. Uh, the IRS tried to change that right after World War II uh, to try to make a health insurance uh, that was sponsored by employers taxable, uh, just like ordinary income. But uh, people said, hey, people do that. So Congress said, you know, we passed a law making, putting that into, into the law that uh, health insurance would not uh, be subject to the same types of taxes that ordinary income was. So it makes it more, it makes it more uh, um, beneficial to offer it that way. And so it, it helped to uh, expand coverage of Healthcare or expand more of these uh, products, uh, healthcare um, uh, sponsored uh, fringe benefits, because it, did, it was treated, it had a, a, a tax advantage to treating it that way. And so uh, in the 40s and then in the 50s and 60s, uh, employer insurance uh, was offered at greater and greater amounts. Uh, so uh, that's the main way people got private insurance and get private insurance today is through their employers, which is odd. You don't get your, you don't get your homeowner's insurance through your employer. You don't get your uh, uh, car insurance through your employer, but you do get your uh, health care insurance. Uh, there's extensive uh, public insurance, Medicare, which is uh, the federal program for the elderly and qualified disabled. Medicaid, which is the uh, joint federal state program for um, uh, qualified indigent people. And then CHIP, which is the Children's Health Insurance uh, Program, which is related to Medicaid. And, and the point of all this then, what I'm really wanting to get to is that health care in the United States is, is extensively characterized by third party pay, payment, third party so one of the most thing, one of the things I want you to think about most with healthcare, you know, cost access quality, that's one. The other thing is think about when decisions are made as to whether some kind of medical service is going to be provided. Um, that decision is largely, and used to be much more, uh, uh, simply between the patient and the provider. Okay? The patient and the physician, they would decide whether something, the payer is not in the room, right? The payer is out, and it used to be, it used to be in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, uh, we had a system in which the payers were, were passive payers. It was what was referred to as a retrospective payment system. Uh, so that, you know, physicians and, payment and, and, and patients would decide whether something would get done, and they would just send the bill to, the insurance company, the insurance company would pay. Until that got very, very expensive. <laughs> and it wasn't so much the insurance companies that cared, because who ultimately is paying, 
who ultimately in our system then, uh, is paying most of the uh, actual, bearing most of the actual burden or paying most of the, the premium costs for uh, insurance, for private insurance. It would be the employers are. I mean, the insurance company, as long as, as long as the employers are willing to pay higher premiums, they don't care whether whether patients and, and physicians are racking up large bills. You know, they'll pay them, and they'll just if the you know, if the uh, 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 claims are getting too high, they just turn around and, and raise the premiums on whoever the policy payers are, uh, who are ultimately in our system are largely the employers. Well, by the 90s, by the late 80s and early 90s, these bills were getting very high for the employers. And the employers were saying, we can't afford this anymore. And so it, by the late 80s and into the 90s, we kind of moved from what was referred to as a retrospective passive payer system to a, a prospective active payer system where the payers, they kind of want to be in the room when some of the decisions are being But they're not. They're not physically in the room. Uh, so there's this. There is this third-party payment issue where a lot of of the actual decision making occurs between two parties, but a lot of the actual payment comes directly uh, by the third party. So how much would that be? Well, when we're talking about direct payments out of national health expenditures, only about one dollar out of ten actually comes. You know, somebody writes a check and that's it for whatever the service that it is. Um, most of the payment comes through one of these third party payers, which would be private health insurance, which ultimately private health insurance is the employers, largely, because they uh, pay, they are the ones that sponsor the uh, most of the private health insurance, or the public uh, programs, Medicare, Medicaid and CHIP. So you can see that Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP, none of which existed in 1960. So uh, in 1960, about, you know, if you went to, you know, most people, if they went to the doctor, they'd take the bill. Um, and, and about half of all uh, payments came out of um, out-of-pocket payments. That number has gone way down. And the insurance part, Third party payer part of that. So, who's who's making the decision as to whether a service is going to be utilized is sort of divorced from, or largely divorced from, who pays. And that's okay if the if the, if the payments are low, if the costs are low. But if the costs are high, then the payers start to say, "Hey, this is I don't want to pay this so much." And so they're going to become much more interested in active. They're going to become active payers interested in that, in the decisions as to how uh, the resources are going to be utilized because it impacts them. Uh, in terms of access then to insurance, uh, what does that mean in terms of how many people do have access to insurance? Well, uh, in, in, uh, at the time that the uh, Affordable Care Act was passed in 2000, Ten, it had gotten to be about uh, 50 million. Uh, I'm skeptical about the numbers, but that's those are the numbers that are, are the most common numbers given by the Bureau of the Census. So about 50 million in percentage terms, it's about 16 percent of the population be uninsured, which means the vast majority has some kind of insurance, like 84 percent of the population have some sort of insurance, whether private or public insurance of some sort. But there is not insignificant amount of people that did not have access to insurance. Um, now, the, 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 the census did some goofy things. So they, they say you can't really compare their pre-2012 numbers directly with the post-2012 numbers, which makes no sense. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say you can because 
they, they, so in 2010, it was about 50 million people uninsured. Then you have the uh, Affordable Care Act, and that number has gone down uh, to, uh, it's estimated, around 29 million, or about 9% of the population is uninsured. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind. Then we're, we're looking at the, the, they're saying that over the course of several years now, uh, largely to the Affordable Care Act, mostly to the Affordable Care Act, the number of uninsured has gone down about 20 million. Um, but insurance has its own uh, sort of issues. Uh, so it's, it's great that, that people would be uh, insured, uh, but there are all sorts of some issues that, that are involved with insurance. Insurance works really well, again, when insurance works best when nobody makes any claims. So what it comes down to more very, but more precisely, it, it, may, it works best when people make relatively small, modest payments and relatively few people make claims for few, you know, infrequent, very large and uncertain events. So the way to think about health insurance and why it's kind of, there's some kind of problematic issues with health insurance is to compare it with, say, homeowner's insurance. Um, homeowner's insurance is, we think of it, you know, far obliterates your house. So you, it's going to be very expensive. It's great you've got homeowner's insurance that can cover that. Um, happens relatively infrequently. You would love it if it never happened at all. Okay, that you would never make any claims. Uh, you never, you don't get to the end of your policy year and say, "Gosh, I didn't make a claim. I wish, I wish somebody, you know, wish we'd have a tornado to, to destroy my house so I could, you know, so because I made, you know, I spent a fifteen hundred dollars on, on homeowners insurance and I haven't been able to make any claims on it. Well, nobody wants to make a claim, on on uh, homeowner's insurance. Uh, same thing with auto insurance. Nobody wants to make a claim on auto insurance, but somehow healthcare is a little different. You know? healthcare is, you know, of course, nobody wants to get sick, but everybody does. It's not like, you know, uh, at, at some point, and almost everybody needs to see a doctor at some point. Uh, a lot of people can go most of the time without having to make any claims on their homeowner's insurance or their auto insurance. But if you've got a health care insurance, there's probably a good chance you're going to make a claim. And, uh, and the way it's structured tends to be that um, it's not just the big catastrophic events that are covered, but even doctor visits and all sorts of visits are, are covered, uh, all sorts of like small claims. Uh, and in a way that um, other types of insurance, you know, the auto and health care, uh, homeowners insurance are not. Um, and it used to be even worse because now we have such things as uh, you know, we have deductibles and co-payments and co-insurance and all those types of things. Um, it wasn't that long ago when uh, deductibles were very, if they existed, were small. You might have a hundred dollar deductible on your health insurance. And that wasn't too long ago. And there's some, I think, some rare places, relatively rare places, that have very, very small deductibles. But those deductibles have gone up and up and up. Um, so it, it, insurance works less well when it, the insurance are sort of frequent and um, and and also tend to happen to a relatively small subset of the population. Uh, so what we might call the sickly. Because then the sickly are the ones that are really going to want the insurance. The people that are healthy are not. And so if only people that are sickly buy insurance and the healthy don't want health insurance, uh, and the sickly are the ones that are going to make claims, then probably the premiums are going to be extremely high. Uh, what you really need for it for a, 
What you really need for insurance is for most people not to make any claims. Uh, and only those who really need it to make the claims. Well, in health insurance, it doesn't really work that way. Um, and, but you have these, you often have very sickly people that want to, that are going to be more likely to use it, they're going to be the ones more likely to seek it. And those that are going to be healthy are not going to want to pay the relatively high premiums that are going to be there. So uh, there is a problem, what are referred to as selection problems. Uh, there's, it's adverse selection. Those who are most likely to need medical services are more likely to seek it. Um, at the same time, from the insurer's point of view, they would love to have it, to be able to offer a policy uh, in which nobody ever makes any claims. That would be perfect. Uh, so they take in premiums, no policy claims go out, that's a great business to be in. Uh, so there's also an issue in, an, in a voluntary system uh, where if only the sickly are looking for insurance, um, those that are providing the insurance, the insurers, will kind of try not to have those, but try to find those people that are not going to be sickly and healthy. Uh, to what's sometimes referred to as, as cream skinning, to have in your policy only the healthy people and try to keep the, the sickly people out. So we've got these, what are referred to as adverse and preferred selection problems, and that's one of the main reasons why this, con this concept of universal coverage is, is thought to be so important. That is, everybody's in, the, everybody's in the pool. You don't have a choice as to whether you're in the pool or out of the pool. That way, everybody's chipping into the pool, and nobody just can, can make the claim that, well, I'm not going to use it, it's too expensive, therefore I'm going to opt out. And say, no, we need you. We need people just like you that are never going to be making claims. We've got to have you in this for it to work. Um, and one of the main features, then, of uh, the Affordable Care Act, as we'll see hopefully in a moment, is, uh, is individual mandate to say you've got to you, you can't opt out you've got to be part of a of a pool okay. uh, another problem with uh, insurance has to do with that third party issue third party payment issue which is uh, you know if you go to the store and um, uh, somebody tells you well I'll pay I'll pay 80% of your costs. What do you think would happen to your uh, weekly grocery bill? Uh, how much weekly groceries would you buy if you knew that somebody was picking up, say, 80% bill? Somebody else is paying a good part of the cost that would you know, create a great incentive for you to buy more than you otherwise would if it was only your money. And that's what happens with insurance with any kind of third-party payment system if somebody else is somehow paying uh, all the bill or a good portion of the bill uh, you have less incentive to, to, to economize and so if, again if you're thinking about the patient uh, um, the patient and physician they're in in the room together making a decision as to whether uh, health services are going to be utilized and the payer is out somewhere else, they're not thinking, they don't have to think about the cost. Uh, they're thinking more about whether this is useful for the patient and maybe for the physician uh, for this to be done. Uh, often if you were to ask a doctor, for example, if the doctor says, you know, I think you should have this treatment or this test, if you were to ask, well, how much is it going to cost? Doctor probably won't know. You're insured, aren't you? Just bill your insurance company. Uh, and so the, the, there's this this issue then in healthcare that's different from most products in that the decision as to what is going to be done is somewhat divorced from who's going to pay for it. And this is sometimes referred to as moral hazards. 
it's a horrible term because it, it makes it sound like this is something immoral about it. And it does go back to, you know, the term moral hazard goes back to, for example, uh, the, in, uh, other types of insurance issues where it used to be the case, well, I don't hear this much anymore, but it used to be the case that people had claimed that their, their car was stolen. And then there really wasn't, but say my, my car has been stolen and they would uh, make a claim on their auto insurance to get that. And that doesn't happen much anymore. I think it's probably because it's easier to track cars. And so that would be one of the hazards of being an insurance is, is, some, is the insured person could do something immoral, unethical to make a claim that was not a legitimate claim. So that, but, and, and therefore, uh, it was possible that the insurers, you know, costs would explode because of this moral hazard issue. Well, that term has come to be applied for this situation, but it doesn't necessarily have to do anything with any ethical or moral issues. Uh, it's simply the case that it's just true that if, if anybody is, has to pay less, you know, if somebody else is going to pay your bill for anything, uh, it's going to increase the likelihood that you're going to buy it, that you're going to use it. And that's a, main, that's a big problem with, with health insurance then, because when you're insured, you're divorced from the cost, the, the, the full cost. And ways, that's why we have things like deductibles and co-insurance and co-payments. It's a way that the, the patient, the, the person that's, that's getting the services ha has some kind of skin in the game. Uh, that they have to somehow, they're not going to be totally divorced from the cost. You know, the insurance company is not going to pick up all the bill. You've got to pick up some of it as well, at least over certain ranges and certain patterns. Um, so that's one of the main problems with it because if, as you expand insurance, it increases dramatically the likelihood that people will use services and increases the cost. So there's this again, tension between cost and access. If you want to increase access, it's almost inevitable that costs are going to explode. Um, if you don't find some structure, if you don't have some way to control those costs. But then controlling those costs often means controlling access in some fashion. So again, there's this tension between cost and access. And then you add onto that the quality part. And here's where the, sort of the, the, the theory of the, um, the, the Affordable Care Act comes into play is, is can health care costs be stemmed and or access to care expanded without negatively impact? Suppose we wanted to both, because um, remember, bending the cost curve is one of the goals of the Affordable Care Act. But they also want to increase access. Um, how, how can you do both of those things without seriously negatively impacting the quality of care? I mean, one way to increase access and, and, and reduce costs would be things like, you know, just not you know, increasing access to people that, you know, as doctors, have not actually past the, the medical exam. Now, you know, increasing the amount of doctors to people that haven't actually gone to medical school, but maybe they've read about it or they've seen it on TV. You know. uh, those guys, there used to be a commercial, you know, remember the commercial where the guy said, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. Yeah. Okay, so increasing, you could, we could dramatically increase the amount of medical personnel by simply dropping all the rules and requirements we have for them. And, would we, that might, it may, and because we might have a lot more of them, we'd be able to pay them less, and, and we might have cheap care for everybody. But again, it would be the doctors that are not real doctors. So is there any way, can we, can we get a grip on cost and expand access at the same time without negatively impacting the quality of care? And one of the, Interesting things about uh, the Affordable Care Act from sort of a theoretical point of view is, is 
is the premise is yes, and the premise is focused on the fact that we don't we don't start with cost and quality. We start with cost and access, but we start with quality. Okay. That by actually improving the quality of the U.S. healthcare system will actually result in an ability to provide lower cost care for more people. Which, oh, how can that be? Well, in this way, uh, here's, a, here's more graphs, remember? I kind of graphs, I throw graphs in. Um, this is something called the health production, production function, which is something that's often talked about in healthcare economics and policies, used to sort of describe or illustrate the argument. Uh, in this, it, it says that, well, our health outcomes, you know, things like, uh, you know, there might be various measures of, of health status, like uh, life expectancy and, and um, uh, infant mortality and other types of, whatever, however we were going to be measuring health outcomes. Uh, this very simple uh, idea of, well, here's uh, medical care, and we would think that as we increase the amount of medical care, our health will be better. But what's interesting is, what's interesting about healthcare, most, I think, lay people, of which I, back in the 90s when I started to actually think about uh, and read about healthcare economics, is I would have thought, you know, well, more healthcare means better health, right? Uh, most people kind of think that that's the case. You know, more, doc more doctors, more nurses, more hospitals, better health. Uh, but actually, that's not really thought to be the case, uh, uh, at least in the way that we, um, uh, we often uh, think. Uh, it's, and from sort of an economics point of view, it is, it is thought that um, uh, the law of diminishing returns applies even to health care. It applies almost to everything, but even to health care. Uh, the more of everything, there's, there are diminishing returns. More, you know, the first pizza, for example, uh, the first slice of pizza is really great and it, it provides a lot of happiness to you. The second slice that you eat, well, it makes you feel better, but the, first, the second slice wasn't as good as the first slice. And the third slice still feel good, still like it, but the third slice wasn't as good as the second slice because I'm starting to get full. And eventually, you know, you eat pizza until finally, uh, maybe that seventh or eighth slice, you, not only do you not feel better, you kind of feel sick. So it might be actually decreasing returns. And that idea is thought to be very prevalent in the U.S. healthcare system, that there is a lot of spending, a lot of utilization on medical care of really kind of very marginal value. Um, and uh, here's a bunch of, there's a bunch of uh, uh, books and my articles on this. This is just kind of give you a flavor of the, of, um, the arguments that they made. Uh, there's a title of the book called Overtreated, another title of the book Overdiagnosed, another title Less Medicine, More Health. And it's just a flavor of kind of, you might be surprised, I don't know, but it really is thought that there's a lot that goes on in healthcare that's uh, not good, in fact, is often harmful. In 1999, there was a very kind of controversial study from the Institute of Medicine that said that, uh, I think it was 17 to 19, I don't remember the numbers, but a large number of people uh, in the country in 1997 uh, died from medical errors. That there was a range given that uh, medical errors, deaths from medical errors, was anywhere from the eighth leading to the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, and so there really is this this thought that there's there's a lot of medical too much. There's too much medicine. We throw, and we get this feeling, you probably heard now about the antibiotics issue. That, that's a good example about how over here we just throw, you know, somebody's got something, here, so here's some antibiotics, here's some antibiotics. Here's some, you got a virus, here's some antibiotics. Well, I mean, antibiotics, I mean, viruses, but 
ah, but what's the harm? Well, it turns out that there can be a lot of harm over uh, doing it. And so this is a big part of the healthcare policy argument, is there really is the thought that there is a lot of waste, a lot of too much medical care, uh, and too much poor medical care. And so the, the, the key aspect and, and, and the idea is that all the incentives in the system are geared towards more, including the third party payer where you've got this divorce between who's making the decision as to whether the uh, 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 medical care will happen and who pays for it. Well, again, that's gonna, that creates a great incentive for too much. The doctor might say, well, you know, the doctor may say, well, we could try this. And the patient say, Okay, let's try that. You know, and if if they had to pay for it directly, they might say, "Well, is it really worth it?" And the doctor might say, "Well, maybe, maybe it'll help, maybe it won't." But it, it, if you don't have to pay for it, go ahead. And so there's all sorts of aspects in the healthcare system where there appears to be incentives to to do to to do more. And that's, I think, the key interesting part of the sort of the theory underneath the Affordable Care Act, which is instead of, in, instead of thinking about this providing more health care, why don't we reorganize how we deliver health care? Remember economics being clashed between uh, limited resources and unlimited wants. Let's take those limited resources and re fashion how we use them okay. um, so that you know in, instead of having more medical care let's have in effect better medical care uh, reor it, it, and, and, and the idea is we might be able to reorganize the healthcare system by focusing on quality but higher quality does not necessarily mean more it just means higher quality. So we focus on quality. The higher quality may be able to, we, we basically find those things that aren't working and we stop paying for those things. That frees up some resources that we didn't have before that we can extend then and use uh, to expand access to people. So it's really kind of a, it's an interesting idea. And that leads us to the, uh, uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, again, that's sort of the, the theory. Now, there's, there's theory and there's policy. There's theory and there's politics. And there is, within the healthcare realm, I think, uh, uh, policymakers that think about this and, 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 and see these, these uh, inefficiencies and find correcting the inefficiencies as a way to increase quality. And then as a byproduct, we can increase the access to care because we freed up resources to be able to do that. But that also fits very well with the you know, politicians because that, that's a, that, that is potentially a um, unicorn type of wonderful everything, all good things, no bad things type of thing. We can have more care, lower costs, and higher quality. And all we have to do is, is pass a 1500 page bill that puts all of these things, you know, puts all this stuff together in one big lump, completely refashions the system, and the result is this wonderful thing where we're able to provide high quality care to more people at lower costs. But there are so many moving parts to that, that in practice, the, in, in practice, it's going to be very difficult for the theory to really play out well. So let's see what, that, what I mean by that. Uh, so in, the uh, Affordable Care Act was signed into law in 2010, and it had these, uh, a, a whole range of features to it. It's very long, very complicated. You've probably heard that. It's, it's true. It's very long, very complicated. Um, 
and full of errors too. I mean, they kind of rushed it through, and so there's there's some problems with it. The problems popped up here and there, as you, as you know. Some of them were, some of those were unforeseen problems, but others were foreseen, but not by necessarily the people that passed. It. So there's again a wide range of things I've picked out from uh, about five large areas, large major features uh, to look at. So let's start with some of these. Now these are the fun ones. These were the one, the easy ones, I guess. These are the popular ones. Is really the, the ones I should say. The very first things that rolled out were uh, just mandates from the government that, for example, dependents uh, can stay on their uh, parents' health plans until they're 26. You've probably heard about that one. That one's very pop very popular. Um, Others, uh, there, uh, you know, prohibition against lifetime limits on coverage, no pre-existing condition, exclusions for children initially, and then some more uh, um, so that now pre-existing conditions are, you can't be uh, turned down because you've had a pre-existing condition. Um, and a variety of these types of little things, of these things. And they're all, but those are all access. These are all access expansions. So there's no you know, quality or, and the cost is going to, of course, go up. Because of so this, these first sort of major popular uh, uh, things that rolled out first were all expanding access. Uh, Medicaid was expanded to all individuals. Well, originally the plan was to expand uh, it to all individuals. Medicaid is a, is a complicated uh, uh, program against joint federal state program for the indigent, um, but it, it differs. It differs from state to state. Okay? Uh, so you could have two sort of identical people in adjoining states, and one person in one state, that the person in one state might be eligible for Medicaid, and the other one not. So it's not necessarily, it hasn't always necessarily been your income that has been the determination of whether you're on Medicaid or not. Well, this changed that somewhat. It said, okay, everybody uh, is going to be uh, uh, eligible for Medicaid up to 130%, of the federal policy uh, poverty level. And uh, the Affordable Care Act is going to say every state had to do this, but the Supreme Court ruled that the this states could not be forced to expand Medicaid coverage, and many, including Texas, uh, has not. That's that's something you'll hear about sometimes. Is Texas is higher uh, uh, uninsured rate because they want to uh, expand access uh, through uh, the ACA to higher amounts of uh, Medicaid uh, population. Uh, there's an individual mandate for time purposes. I won't get into that too much other than just saying that you know, there's a fine uh, penalty if you don't uh, purchase health insurance. If you're uninsured, um, you don't have insurance through your work, you can't get insurance through the government, you still have to go out and get insurance. You don't have the option without being penalized. Uh, you may have heard this, this ish, issue a few years ago about uproar. This is how can you force somebody to buy a product? How can you force somebody? You can can the government force you to buy broccoli? And uh, similarly, then can the government force you to buy this other product called insurance? And so um, that wound its way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and in 2012, the Supreme Court, in a controversial and kind of weird decision, said, well, it is unconstitutional to penalize somebody for not buying a product that you want them to buy. However, since it's so much like a tax, and the government can tax you, it is constitutional. So it is constitutional. It's an interesting legal Pleasure to name there. Um, well, where would these people get if they're not insured through the government and if they're not insured through their employer, where are they going to get insurance? Well, they would get insurance through something called the exchanges, which you probably heard of. 
Um, and so there'd be state exchanges where people would go to, and um, if they couldn't afford it, if their incomes were in certain ranges, uh, they would um, not be, uh, they, would, they would get help. So you'd get either uh, subsidies or, or cost sharing uh, or premium supports of some sort uh, through the government uh, if they don't have high enough income. Uh, so originally the idea was that the plans would be offered through you know, a variety of the right, Blue Cross and others would offer plans in these exchanges. Um, originally, uh, it was thought that there was going to be something called a public option in there as well. So as you get, you know, go onto the, onto the website, health, healthcare.gov, and say, okay, here's Aetna is offering this type of coverage, and Blue Cross offering this type of coverage at these premiums. And then there would be also a public taxpayer-supported option. Well, when that first came out in, in 2009, when, when they were talking about and the roll up to passing the Affordable Care Act, there, were, uh, there was a lot of um, resistance even amongst Democrats, uh, certain Democrats like Joe Lieberman, uh, towards this public option. The idea that being that, well, if you've got a taxpayer supported system, you've got these other, these others have to offer premiums that are, will work for them. You know, they can't offer it for a loss forever. Um, so they have to be high enough premiums so that they, that they could stay in business. But if you've got a publicly supported one, the taxpayers could, could always draw money from the taxpayer. And the fear was that would create a system in which the public option would be systematically cheaper than the others. And people would get on the uh, healthcare.gov website, they'd say, here's Aetna, here's Blue Cross, here's others. They're offering these premiums, and then here's this public option, whatever the name of it might be. And they said, well, that's, that's cheaper, we'll go for that. And people would just surge into that. Uh, and leaving these others offering program policies either that would, that would not be, they couldn't charge enough to keep them in place, or they were charging so much that nobody would uh, want them. So the fear would be that eventually all of these, would, the, the, pi the private companies would peel off and all people would be left with was, would be a public option. Um, and, uh, um, Interestingly, about a year ago, President Obama said, you know, he was the, and, he, and here's sort of the five minutes, how do I do this? Um, but I think it's important because if you've got a situation in which you, you have these healthcare exchanges and you've got a public option in there, and the public option is able to underprice the others, the other companies are going to peel out, leaving the individuals with only the public option. And it becomes what is referred to, basically was referred to as a single payer type of system, which is a Canadian system, which is really what I think is ultimately, that's why it was in there in the first place. The idea is eventually that uh, the public option, they had, to pull the, they had to pull the public option out in 2009 because there was some resistance to it. They couldn't get, um, uh, passage of the bill without with the public option in, but I think it's always been thought that eventually, you know, when there are problems, when or if, and some you know, some people said if, a lot of people said when there are problems in the health exchanges and they become very expensive and, and companies start pulling out as has happened, that there will be an enormous uh, um, uh, sentiment towards adding the public option. Now, President Trump comes in unexpectedly and wins. That kind of throws things, but but I think that's sort of still the idea, or it was the idea, is that okay? Now you pull it, put in the public option that fixes, if you will, the uh, health exchange issue. Uh, there's an employer mandate um, uh, that the employers must offer coverage. Uh, I'll skip a 
these are interesting numbers though too. So I want to make sure, just for its own sake, do you know how much, how much an employer-based uh, uh, policy costs? And as employers usually pick up at least m most of the, the bill. Uh, on average, in 2016, for employer-based uh, programs, for a, for a family, it costs, uh, a, 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 a family policy in the United States costs $18,000, of which the employer picked up most of that. The employee, you know, employee picks up a huge amount as well. So it's, it's pretty expensive. Uh, very quick, I, I, I won't, I'll look, I'll let you, I know you'll be dying to pour through these numbers, make sure that they're right. Uh, but there does appear that there, if, if employers don't offer insurance, then they have to pay a, pay a, a penalty. Uh, but the penalty is really relatively small, the penalty is going to be what? cheaper than paying the insurance. Uh, so there really is a strong incentive, I think, over time for businesses. The, I, I believe the, the idea was you have the employers start dropping the insurance because it's more expensive, as long as you, but there's this exchange that people can go to. So you just say, hey, yeah, we're dropping the insurance, but we'll give you a raise you know, in terms of actual money. So you get a raise, we'll drop the insurance, but we'll direct you to the, to the exchanges and you get your insurance from there. And there in the insurance, there's the public option. So I think it's, there's a good, there's a good argument to, to state this. The Affordable Care Act was a, an attempt to implement single payer uh, graduate. Um, so, uh, the ACA's major features also include there are th but there are quality issues there are quality things here so there's all sorts of things like accountable care organizations this is all very interesting minutia for our point for our purposes but not for health policy uh, oh, and, and for time purposes we can't look at it too much uh, there's something called the independent payment advisory board uh, sorry for zipping through this, but you can also you can read it if you like. Uh, that was supposed to be one of the big parts of sort of the cost containment was this thing called the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Uh, but, um, but it's politically unpopular, and so it's never actually happened. Um, then there were some cost projections um, very quickly. Um, the original cost projections were such that uh, the ACA over 10 years would cost close to a trillion dollars. Well, how do you pay for that? Uh, <clears throat> this sort of tells you how you were supposed to pay for it. Large, it would be through some fees, um, higher Medicare payroll taxes, um, but what I watched largely through Medicare and Medicaid savings, uh, which we don't really have to get. How would they be able to? Where did these savings come from? Well, that's where, like, the independent payment advisory board that I just skipped over, the accountable care organizations, the, the sort of the innovation, the new thing, those things that are supposed to help find what works, and we'll pay for those and find what don't work, and we'll stop paying for those things. So revamping the system is going to provide the savings, savings then that we'll be able to apply to expanded coverage. But that's quite a bit. So most of it is supposed to come out of savings, and so this is, this is sort of the law. How are we supposed to get all of these uh, save, that much savings when, uh, when we're expanding Medicare because baby boomers are retiring? Uh, I don't care how efficient uh, Medicare, uh, Medicare is going to be at delivering medical services and cutting costs. I don't see them being able to cut costs very dramatically, particularly as baby boomers continue to retire and become more and more expensive. So it's a, there's sort of a hand waving uh, about the savings that was, that's supposed to come from that. Um, and I can get through this in a minute. Um, in terms of the access projections, uh, what you'll hear now, a big story of course now is as the as the Republican Senate 
the Republican Congress looks, works on this repeal and replace, they are confronted with the fact that now there's, there has been an expansion in access, and any kind of change is almost assuredly going to mean to having some people that didn't have access, that now have access through the ACA, will now not have access. And that is going to be extremely difficult politically to, to, to do anything. Who would have known that healthcare was so complicated? Uh, yeah, yeah, who would have known that? It was just one of the, <laughs> President Trump said that. Yeah. Was, who, nobody knew that healthcare could be so complicated, he said back, I think, in March or something yeah. like that. So, uh, <laughs> so um, but even, even, even under the, the best of scenarios, the Affordable Care Act was never projected to reduce the uninsured to zero. Okay. So it's never really been thought of, even by Democrats, as the last word on the matter. Okay. So up next, I don't know. But uh, anyway, but that's, my, that's my spiel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, there are some, uh, um, again, uh, websites and, and references and my contact information if you've got questions or want maybe um, reference to maybe what a short article or something might be that might be helpful. Um, uh, let me know. Thanks Thank all you. for your attention. Enjoy it.